Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Before I dive into today's stories, I want to say, disclaimer, the content presented in the video is purely for entertainment purposes only. The theories and stories discussed in this video are speculative and are not supported by any evidence or proof. Viewer discretion is advised. I've been browsing the dark web for a while. Nothing too serious, mostly just curiosity and the weird thrill of stumbling onto strange corners of the internet. Most of the time it's a bunch of nonsense or scams, but occasionally you find something that gets under your skin. That's how I ended up clicking on a link labeled The Infinite Warehouse. The name intrigued me, I'll admit. The description was vague, but hinted at this bizarre idea, a place where every lost, forgotten, or stolen object eventually ended up. It had a live feed, too, showing a massive, dimly lit warehouse. The camera was fixed, but what it captured was unsettling. Rows upon rows of crates, old furniture, trinkets, all stacked haphazardly as far as the eye could see. There was no clear end in sight. The feed had no sound, just the flicker of poor lighting and the occasional shift in the shadows. It wasn't exactly a jump scare sort of thing. No, it was more subtle, the kind of image that keeps you staring, waiting for something to happen, even though nothing really does. What really caught my attention was something buried deep in the site's code. A set of coordinates. I have a bit of coding experience, so it wasn't too difficult to extract the data. I'll be honest. Part of me thought it was just a game or an elaborate marketing gimmick. But I couldn't get the warehouse out of my head. It was late, and I knew it was probably a bad idea, but that sense of curiosity got the better of me. So I punched the coordinates into Google Maps, and to my surprise, it pointed to an abandoned industrial building just outside town. The place was easy enough to find, tucked away behind a series of older buildings that had been left to rot. It had the classic rundown look, rusting doors, cracked windows, and graffiti covering every wall. I half expected to find nothing of interest inside, maybe just some squatters or old machinery, but the second I stepped through the door, I realized this wasn't just another abandoned building. The air was heavy the kind that makes you slow down as if you're walking through water. There was an odd smell too, not decay, but something musty like an old attic that hadn't been touched in decades. I don't know what I was expecting, but definitely not what I found. Inside, the space was eerily similar to what I had seen on the dark web feed. Endless rows of crates, furniture, and random objects piled up everywhere. It was almost identical, except this wasn't on a screen anymore. It was real. And the space, it didn't make sense. From the outside, the building looked big, but not infinite. Yet standing there, it seemed to stretch on forever. Like the walls weren't really there, or like the building itself had somehow swallowed more space than it physically could. I walked deeper, and that's when I started noticing the details. Every crate, every object seemed out of place, as if they had been plucked from different points in time old rusted bicycles leaning against Victorian-era dressers, VHS tapes stacked on top of rotary phones, things that shouldn't be together, yet here they were, abandoned in this strange limbo. Some of the items looked newer, more recent, cell phones, laptops, even a few modern appliances, but they were mixed in with relics from the past. That's when I saw it, a jacket. It wasn't anything special, just an old leather jacket thrown over a dusty chair, but I knew that jacket. I had one just like it when I was a teenager, and I remembered losing it during a house move years ago. It couldn't be the same one. Could it? My hand hovered over it for a moment, but I pulled back, not wanting to touch it. Something about the place was making me cautious, even though I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. As I continued walking, the warehouse seemed to shift. The piles of objects grew taller, the narrow paths between them winding in ways that made it easy to lose track of where I'd come from. I kept telling myself it was just my imagination playing tricks, but after a while, I couldn't ignore the feeling that the warehouse itself was moving. 
The crates and furniture weren't in the same spots anymore. They had shifted, subtly, but enough to make me second guess which way was out. And then there was the quiet, the kind of silence that fills your ears and makes every little sound seem amplified. My footsteps felt too loud, echoing in a space that shouldn't echo. It was unsettling, like the warehouse was absorbing all sound, keeping it close. I thought about turning back, but something in me kept pushing forward. Maybe it was that same curiosity, the one that had gotten me to this point. Maybe it was something else, something that made me feel like I needed to keep going to see what was deeper inside. Then I saw it. A small handwritten note stuck to a dusty mirror leaning against a stack of old trunks. The paper was yellowed with age, the ink smudged, but I could still make out the words. Do not take anything, it will notice. It was such a simple warning, but it made me pause. Who or what was this it? And what did it mean by noticing? I looked around, suddenly aware of how alone I was in this massive, endless space. There was no one else here, right? Yet the longer I stood there, the more I felt like the warehouse wasn't as empty as it seemed. That's when I decided I had seen enough. I needed to get out, get some fresh air, and clear my head. But as I turned around, the path behind me was no longer there. I stood frozen for a moment, staring at the space where the exit should have been. I hadn't wandered too far in, or at least I didn't think I had. But now the narrow aisle I'd walked through was gone, replaced by towering stacks of old furniture, boxes, and strange artifacts that seemed to close in around me. It didn't make any sense. The building wasn't supposed to be that large, and yet, here I was, feeling as if the place had shifted itself. The air inside felt thick, not suffocating, but enough to make you aware of every breath you took. I knew I needed to stay calm and think logically. I couldn't be trapped, not in a building that had a door somewhere, but the longer I stared at the endless rows of stuff, the more the idea of infinite started to seem real. I took a few steps forward, hoping that retracing my path might help. I kept my eyes on the ground, trying to spot any familiar signs, footprints, dust disturbances, anything that might give me a clue. But the floor was undisturbed, as if no one had walked through here in years. I felt myself growing frustrated, but I didn't let it get to me. Instead, I focused on finding patterns in the space around me. If I could figure out how this place was organized, maybe I could find a way out. As I wandered, I noticed something I hadn't before. Labels. Some of the crates had small tags, handwritten and taped to their sides. I leaned in closer to one, squinting in the dim light to read the words. Lost, 1978, Brooklyn, New York. Another crate just beside it read, Abandoned, 1992, Kyoto, Japan. There were more. Every box seemed to have a label, and they all told a story. Not of the items inside, but of where and when they had been lost or forgotten. It hit me then. The warehouse was exactly what it claimed to be. Every forgotten object, every lost possession, they were all here. I ran my fingers over the dusty label of an old beat-up suitcase. Misplaced, 1964, Paris, France. I pulled back my hand, suddenly aware that I was touching something that had been lost before I was even born. There was something strange about the idea, almost like I was trespassing on the memories of people who'd lived lifetimes ago. I moved further down the aisles, the stacks growing more chaotic and cluttered as I walked. There were no clear paths anymore, just narrow gaps between heaps of items. Old clocks, vintage cameras, broken toys, things that looked like they'd been plucked straight from another era. It was eerie in a way, but not because of what the objects were. It was more about how they ended up here, as if the warehouse had swallowed them up over time. After what felt like an hour of walking, I stumbled upon something different. In the center of an open space, there was a large, ornate wooden desk. It didn't fit with the rest of the clutter. It was too pristine, too carefully placed. 
On top of it sat a single object, a small black and white photograph. I picked it up, examining the image. It showed a family, likely from the early 1900s, standing in front of an old farmhouse. They were dressed in simple clothes, the kind you'd see in history books, and they all had somber expressions as if they hadn't smiled in years. Something about the photograph seemed off, though. The background, the trees, and the sky looked too crisp, too detailed. Almost as if the photograph wasn't just capturing a moment, but something more. Alive. Suddenly I noticed something else. The same jacket I'd seen earlier, my jacket, was in the background of the photograph, draped over a fence post. My pulse quickened, though I forced myself not to jump to conclusions. It was probably just a coincidence, right? Maybe the jacket was a common style back then, but deep down something gnawed at me, something I couldn't explain. As I placed the photograph back on the desk, I noticed a faint noise. A soft, rhythmic creaking, like an old door swaying in the wind. But the thing was, there was no wind. I glanced around trying to pinpoint where it was coming from, but the sound seemed to echo from all directions, bouncing off the walls of the warehouse. I felt the urge to keep moving, to not linger in one spot for too long. The objects around me seemed to loom larger as I walked past them, as if the space itself was shifting with each step. More labels caught my eye as I moved, more stories of things lost and forgotten. Some were recent, others ancient, but each one told a story that felt just a little too personal. Then I came across something that stopped me in my tracks. A small, rusted tricycle leaning against a stack of crates. It was old, but I recognized it immediately. My heart sank. I had one just like it as a kid. I'd lost it in a park when I was five, and I still remember how much I'd cried when we couldn't find it. The memory came flooding back as I stood there staring at the rusty frame. It wasn't possible, right? It couldn't be the same one. Or could it? I took a deep breath and forced myself to keep moving, trying to push the thought out of my mind. But the more I walked, the more familiar things I started seeing. Objects that seemed too personal, too tied to my own life. A backpack I had in middle school, a pair of headphones I'd misplaced years ago, it was like the warehouse wasn't just a collection of random items, but a repository for every single thing I had ever lost. That's when I knew I had to leave. Whatever this place was, it was starting to feel too connected to me. The items, the labels, the photograph, it all seemed too deliberate, too targeted. I quickened my pace, trying to find a path that would lead me out. But the rows of crates and furniture seemed to grow taller, more confining. And then, just as I was about to give up, I saw something in the distance, a faint light, barely visible through the maze of clutter. It looked like it could be an exit, a way out of this endless labyrinth. I started walking towards it, my steps quick but measured, not wanting to disturb the fragile balance of the space around me. As I got closer, the light grew brighter, more defined. I could almost make out the shape of a door, but just as I reached it, the light flickered, and then everything went dark. The sudden darkness threw me off balance. One second I was reaching for what I thought was an exit. The next I was swallowed by blackness so complete it felt like the entire warehouse had vanished around me. I stood still, straining to hear anything that might help me figure out where I was. The air felt different now thicker, heavier, like the warehouse had somehow expanded, stretching beyond its physical limits. I fumbled in my pocket for my phone, my only source of light, but the screen barely flickered to life. The battery was critically low, though I could have sworn I had more charge when I arrived. I swiped to turn on the flashlight, a weak beam cutting through the darkness. It wasn't much, but at least I could see a few feet ahead. I shone it around trying to find the path I'd been following. But everything looked different now. The walls of crates and furniture had shifted again, towering over me in strange, distorted shapes. I took a deep breath, reminding myself that this was just an old warehouse. Maybe it was all part of some elaborate trick, 
some weird psychological experiment meant to mess with visitors. That's what I kept telling myself as I started walking, following the faint trail of light from my phone. As I moved forward, the objects around me began to feel even more personal. I passed a stack of old vinyl records, their covers worn and faded, but one caught my eye, a record I'd owned as a teenager, one I'd left behind in a move. The familiar cover art was unmistakable. I stopped for a moment, staring at it, wondering how it had ended up here. The warehouse wasn't just a collection of forgotten items anymore, it was a graveyard for my own memories. The further I walked, the more the warehouse seemed to react to me. The aisles twisted and turned in ways that didn't make sense, creating an almost maze-like structure. I was starting to wonder if this place even had an end. Every time I thought I was making progress, the layout shifted, blocking my path with more piles of forgotten relics. And that's when I noticed something new. Sounds. Soft. Almost imperceptible at first. Like a faint humming in the distance. It was rhythmic, pulsing, and seemed to come from deep within the warehouse. I couldn't tell if it was machinery or something else entirely, but the noise was persistent, growing louder the deeper I ventured. It wasn't threatening, not exactly, but it felt out of place in the stillness of the warehouse. I followed the sound, my curiosity getting the better of me once again. Maybe there was someone else here, or perhaps it was some old generator running in the background. Either way, it was better than standing in the dark, waiting for the warehouse to close in on me again. The further I walked, the stranger the objects became. Old paintings covered in dust, their frames chipped and worn. Piles of vintage televisions stacked like towers, their screens cracked and flickering with static, though there was no visible power source. It was as if the warehouse was a dumping ground for not just physical objects, but forgotten pieces of time itself. Then up ahead I saw something that made me stop in my tracks. It was an old wooden door, standing alone in the middle of an open space with nothing supporting it. It shouldn't have been there. There were no walls, no hinges, just a door resting upright as if waiting for someone to open it. I hesitated, shining my phone's light around the area, but the door was the only thing in sight. There were no labels, no signs to explain why it was there or where it led. The rhythmic humming I'd been hearing was coming from behind it steady and almost hypnotic now. I knew I should have turned back. Every instinct in me was telling me that this wasn't right, that the warehouse was toying with me, drawing me deeper into its endless corridors. But I couldn't shake the feeling that this door was important, that it held some kind of answer to the strange things I'd seen. My hand hovered over the handle, hesitating for just a moment before I grasped it. The wood felt cold, older than it looked, and as I turned the knob, I braced myself for what might be on the other side. The door creaked open, revealing a narrow staircase leading downward. The air that drifted up from below was colder, tinged with a smell I couldn't quite place. It wasn't unpleasant, but it was strange, like the scent of old books mixed with damp earth. I took a step forward, the stairs creaking beneath my weight. The further down I went, the more the atmosphere changed. It wasn't the warehouse anymore, not exactly. The walls grew narrower, more tunnel-like, as if I was descending into a different place entirely. The rhythmic hum from before was louder now, almost vibrating through the walls. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was walking into something ancient, something that had been hidden away for a long time. The staircase eventually opened up into a small chamber, dimly lit by a single hanging bulb that flickered intermittently. The room was sparse, except for one object in the center, a large wooden chest. It was covered in intricate carvings, worn down by time but still recognizable as some kind of symbol. I couldn't tell what the symbols meant, but they felt significant. I approached the chest, my footsteps echoing in the otherwise silent room. There was no lock, just a simple latch keeping it closed. I hesitated for a moment, but curiosity got the better of me again. I knelt down and slowly lifted the lid. Inside, resting on a bed of faded velvet, was a single object, a small key. It was old, tarnished, and didn't look like it belonged to anything in the warehouse. Yet somehow, 
I knew it was important. I picked up the key, turning it over in my hands. As I did, the rhythmic hum around me seemed to intensify, almost like the warehouse itself was reacting to the discovery. I didn't know what the key unlocked, but I had a feeling that whatever it was, it wasn't going to be easy to find. As I stood there key in hand, I realized something else. The door I had entered through, the one that led me down the staircase, was gone. I stood there for a long moment, gripping the key tightly in my hand, my eyes scanning the room for the door that had disappeared behind me. I knew I had entered through it, climbed down the staircase, but now there was no sign of it at all. Just solid stone walls, damp and aged, enclosing me in this strange underground chamber. The rhythmic humming had quieted, reduced to a low pulse that seemed to vibrate through the walls, almost like the warehouse was breathing. I looked back at the key, its tarnished metal reflecting the faint light from the flickering bulb above. What did it unlock? And why was it hidden here, beneath an endless maze of forgotten objects? I wasn't sure I wanted to find out, but I didn't have much of a choice. With no way back, I needed to keep moving forward. The small chamber didn't offer much in the way of clues. Aside from the chest I'd found the key in, the room was barren. The stone walls felt cold and uninviting, the floor uneven and slick beneath my feet. I ran my hand along one of the walls, hoping to find some hidden mechanism, a switch, or anything that might lead me to the next step. But there was nothing, just stone. That's when I noticed something subtle. The floor beneath me wasn't entirely solid. There were faint grooves, almost imperceptible at first. But when I crouched down to take a closer look, I realized they formed a pattern. A series of thin lines ran across the floor, intersecting at various points like a grid or a map. And at the center of the pattern, barely visible, was a small indentation, just big enough for a key. I hesitated for a moment, then knelt down and pressed the key into the indentation. It clicked into place with surprising ease, and the moment it did, the floor beneath me shifted. I stumbled back, startled as the stone tiles began to slide apart, revealing a dark passageway that descended even deeper into the earth. There was no turning back now. The warehouse had led me here, and I couldn't leave until I found out why. With one last glance at the empty chamber behind me, I stepped into the passageway, the stone walls closing in as I moved further down. The descent was slow and steady, the air growing colder and more oppressive with each step. The rhythmic humming had returned, louder now, almost as if it was guiding me deeper into the warehouse's depths. I tried not to think about how far I had come, how impossible this all was. I had entered a simple building, yet now I was in a place that defied reason. As the passage leveled out, I found myself in another large, open space. This one was different from the rest, cleaner, more organized. Rows of metal shelving units lined the walls, each one meticulously stacked with items that were carefully labeled and categorized. It looked almost like a museum or an archive, but instead of ancient artifacts, the shelves were filled with everyday objects. Books, photographs, personal belongings, all arranged with an unsettling precision. I walked down one of the aisles, scanning the labels. They were similar to the ones I'd seen earlier in the warehouse, but more specific. Lost, 1985, New York City. Forgotten, 2001, Seattle, Washington. The items here weren't just random, they were part of people's lives, things that had been misplaced or abandoned over the years. Some of them looked brand new, while others were clearly decades old, their edges worn from time and use. It wasn't until I reached the end of the aisle that I saw something that made my stomach tighten. There, sitting on a shelf in the corner, was a small wooden box. It wasn't the box itself that bothered me, it was what was written on the label. Misplaced, 2022. It was the name of my hometown. I froze, staring at the box. That was my hometown, my year. I hadn't lost anything recently, had I? 
But the box was there, sitting on the shelf, as if waiting for me. Slowly, cautiously, I reached out and picked it up. It felt light, almost fragile in my hands. I ran my fingers over the label again, but the writing was clear. This was connected to me somehow. I opened the box, half expecting it to be empty, but inside was something I hadn't expected at all, an old photograph. I pulled it out carefully, turning it over in my hands. The image showed a small group of people standing in front of a house, their faces blurred with time, but one of them stood out to me. It was a younger version of myself, no older than six or seven, standing beside my childhood home. I hadn't seen this photograph in years, I had forgotten about it completely, but here it was, in this impossible place. How had it ended up here? Who or what had brought it here? I put the photograph back in the box, my mind spinning with questions I couldn't answer. As I placed the box back on the shelf, something strange happened. The rhythmic hum, the ever-present noise that had followed me through the warehouse, seemed to shift. It became more erratic, almost anxious, as if the warehouse itself was reacting to my discovery. I backed away from the shelves, unsure of what to do next. The objects around me, the perfectly organized items, now felt like pieces of a puzzle I couldn't solve. I glanced around the room, looking for an exit, and that's when I saw it. Another door, tucked away in the corner. This one was metal, with a large wheel in the center, like something you'd find on a submarine. Without thinking, I moved toward it, my hand gripping the wheel tightly. It was stiff, but with some effort, I managed to turn it, the metal groaning as the door swung open. A gust of cold air rushed out, carrying with it the unmistakable scent of earth and stone. I stepped through the door, my heart pounding in my chest as I realized where I was. The warehouse wasn't just a place for lost and forgotten objects. It was something more, something deeper, and whatever it was, I wasn't sure I wanted to know. Stepping through the metal door, I was hit by a blast of cold air. The scent of damp earth and stone was more potent here like I had descended into a hidden cavern beneath the warehouse. The rhythmic humming that had followed me all this time seemed to fade into the background, replaced by an unsettling silence. This part of the warehouse, or whatever this place was, felt different, less like a storage facility and more like something that had been sealed away, forgotten for reasons I couldn't yet comprehend. The floor beneath me was no longer the uneven stone of the warehouse, but packed dirt, soft and giving under my feet. I looked around, trying to get my bearings, but there was nothing but darkness beyond the narrow beam of my phone's flashlight. The light flickered again, its battery nearly drained, and I knew I didn't have much time. I pushed forward, the narrow tunnel winding deeper into the earth. The walls were rough, uneven, as if they had been carved out hastily, not with the care of the rest of the warehouse. Every now and then, I would catch a glimpse of something embedded in the dirt. Fragments of old furniture, pieces of shattered glass, remnants of objects long forgotten. It was like the deeper I went, the older the objects became, buried and left to decay with time. After what felt like an eternity, the tunnel opened up into a large cavernous space. My flashlight flickered again, casting weak, intermittent light across the room. It was hard to make out the details but there was one thing I could see clearly, a massive structure towering in the center of the room. It was a door, unlike any I had seen before. Made entirely of dark weathered wood, it stood at least 10 feet tall, with intricate carvings that twisted and spiraled in strange, unsettling patterns. At the center of the door was a keyhole, its edges worn smooth by time. I didn't need to think twice, I knew the key I'd found earlier was meant for this. I approached the door slowly, my hands shaking slightly as I pulled the key from my pocket. It felt heavier now, almost as if it had absorbed the weight of everything I had seen in the warehouse. I hesitated for a moment, my mind racing with questions. What was behind this door? Was it the end of the warehouse or something even more disturbing? But there was no turning back now. 
I slid the key into the keyhole and turned it. The door creaked open with a deep, resonant groan, the sound echoing through the chamber. I took a deep breath and stepped through, my heart pounding as I entered the room beyond. What I saw was unexpected. It wasn't another maze of objects, nor was it some dark, foreboding chamber. Instead, I found myself standing in a small, neatly organized room. The walls were lined with bookshelves, each one filled with old leather-bound volumes, their spines cracked with age. A single wooden desk sat in the center of the room, a dim lamp casting a soft yellow glow over its surface. On the desk was a single sheet of paper, neatly folded with my name written on it. I blinked, confused. How did they know my name? I approached the desk cautiously, my mind racing with possibilities. Was this some sort of elaborate trap? A cruel joke? I picked up the piece of paper, unfolding it carefully. The handwriting was old-fashioned, precise, almost like it had been written with a fountain pen. The note was short, only a few sentences. You have reached the heart of the infinite warehouse. What you seek lies not in what you have found, but in what you have lost. Everything here is connected to a memory, a moment, a choice. The warehouse is infinite because loss is infinite. Take this knowledge with you, and remember, what is forgotten is never truly gone. I stared at the note, my mind struggling to process what it meant. Everything in the warehouse was tied to loss. The objects, the strange patterns, even the key. They were all connected to the things people had forgotten, things that had slipped through the cracks of time. And now I was part of it whether I wanted to be or not. I glanced around the room again, my eyes falling on the shelves, the desk, the lamp. It all seemed so normal, so ordinary, and yet I knew that nothing here was what it appeared to be. This place, this infinite warehouse, wasn't just a physical location. It was a space where memories, moments, and choices were stored, forgotten by the world, but kept alive in the endless corridors of time. I folded the note carefully and placed it back on the desk. There was nothing more to do here, nothing more to find. The answers I had come for weren't physical. They were tied to something deeper, something intangible. The warehouse had shown me that. As I turned to leave, I noticed a small door on the far side of the room. It was unremarkable, plain wood with a simple handle. I walked over to it, half expecting it to lead to yet another part of the warehouse. But when I opened it, I found myself staring at the familiar sight of the outside world. The night air was cool and fresh against my skin, a stark contrast to the stifling atmosphere of the warehouse. I stepped outside, the door closing softly behind me. When I turned around to look at the building, there was no sign of the warehouse I had just been in. It was just an old, abandoned structure the kind you'd pass by without a second thought. For a moment, I stood there, staring at the empty lot in disbelief. The warehouse was gone, or maybe it had never been there in the first place. But I knew better. I knew what I had seen, what I had experienced. The note's words echoed in my mind. What is forgotten is never truly gone. With that, I walked away, leaving the abandoned building behind. I didn't know if I'd ever return or if I'd even want to, but one thing was certain. The infinite warehouse wasn't just a place. It was an idea, a reminder that even the things we lose, the moments we forget, are never truly lost. They live on somewhere, waiting to be found again. I'm not the kind of person who believes in curses or haunted houses. I've always approached the supernatural with a healthy dose of skepticism, but when I stumbled upon that strange auction on the dark web, something about it tugged at me. The listing was simple. The Mirror House, a cursed home for the boldest among you. It was cryptic, almost laughable, but it came with a warning that whoever entered the house would become trapped in the reflections. The house's location wouldn't be revealed until after the auction closed. I don't even know why I was browsing that part of the internet. 
curiosity, boredom, whatever the reason, I placed a bid, not thinking I'd win. I was outbid almost immediately, but I kept watching as the price slowly crept up. People were genuinely interested in this thing, and that only fueled my intrigue. The idea that a house made of mirrors could somehow trap people inside their own reflection sounded ridiculous. But as the auction came to a close, I was hit with a final notification. You've won. I laughed. It wasn't a huge sum of money, but still, I had just purchased a house I'd never seen. Something supposedly cursed. When the location dropped into my inbox, my heart beat a little faster. The house was real. Located deep in a forest about an hour's drive from my home, far away from civilization. Against my better judgment, I decided to check it out. The drive out there felt longer than it was, mostly because the road became more and more isolated the deeper I went. Trees stretched tall and thick on either side of me, and the sky above dimmed as the foliage closed in. Eventually, I pulled up to a small clearing where the house sat, just as described a quaint little cottage. On the outside, it looked normal. No eerie vibe, no creaking wood or sinister mist clinging to the ground. If anything, it looked underwhelming. But the second I stepped inside, the world seemed to change. Every single surface, walls, floors, ceilings, was covered in mirrors. From the front door, I could see my reflection staring back at me from a hundred angles, as if I had walked into a fun house. The light from the outside windows bounced around endlessly, giving the entire space a strange, hollow brightness. It felt like standing in the center of a kaleidoscope. For a while, I just walked through the house. The air was cold, but not unnaturally so. My shoes tapped against the mirrored floors, each step echoing louder than it should have. I could see myself everywhere, moving as I moved. But then something shifted. At first, it was subtle. I walked past one of the rooms and caught a glimpse of my reflection. But it didn't move. It just stood there. I stopped, retraced my steps, and glanced again. This time, my reflection mirrored my every move. I shook it off probably just a trick of the light or my mind playing games with me. After all, the house was practically built for optical illusions. I continued walking, moving from room to room, exploring. The layout was surprisingly simple for such a bizarre structure. There were no bedrooms or kitchens, just open spaces, almost like an art installation rather than a real home. As I wandered, I began to feel disoriented. The mirrors made it difficult to keep track of where I had been and where I was going. Each room looked identical to the last, and with my reflection repeating itself endlessly, I began to lose my sense of direction. Then it happened again. This time I was looking directly at my reflection in one of the larger mirrors when I noticed it. It blinked, but I hadn't. My stomach tightened. I stepped closer to the mirror, staring at myself. My reflection stood perfectly still, eyes wide open, unblinking, while I blinked again. I backed away, suddenly aware of how quiet the house had become. My breathing sounded too loud in the empty space. I glanced around, trying to spot anything out of place, but it was just me, or was it? That's when I noticed something even stranger. In one of the mirrors, just off to the side, my reflection was slightly out of sync. As I turned my head, it seemed to turn just a fraction too late. My mind raced to make sense of it. Maybe it was some kind of delayed image, but there was no technology in this place, nothing that would explain it. And as I stood there staring, I realized it wasn't just one reflection. Slowly across the room, my reflections, all of them, were starting to act independently. I took a step back. One of my reflections took a step forward. I turned, and another stayed perfectly still, while others moved to the left to the right, moving in ways that I didn't. My heart pounded as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. Was this the curse the auction had warned about? Was I really getting trapped in the reflections? It seemed impossible, but the more I stared at myself, at all these different versions of myself, I felt like I was losing control. I took a deep breath, trying to stay calm. This had to be some elaborate prank or an effect I wasn't aware of. But as I turned to leave, I realized I couldn't find the door. 
Every wall was mirrored, and in the endless reflections, the exit had disappeared. The house wanted something. I could feel it. I stood there surrounded by endless versions of myself all trapped within the mirrored walls. I tried not to panic, though everything around me felt increasingly wrong. As I turned, the reflections moved again, some following, others staying put. It was like being in a room full of people who looked exactly like me but had minds of their own. The air in the house grew heavier, thick with a kind of pressure that made it hard to think straight. I needed to find the door, or at least figure out how to get back to the entrance. That was the plan simple enough, but as I moved trying to navigate through the rooms, my reflection began to behave more erratically. One version of me smiled as I passed by, but I hadn't smiled. Another seemed to frown, and others stood perfectly still, watching me, or at least mimicking the act of watching without their eyes truly following. The unsettling part wasn't just that they were moving independently, but that they were acting out different versions of me, expressions and gestures I wasn't making. I could still hear my footsteps echoing around the mirrored house, but the sound felt strange too, as though the house was absorbing it, dulling it as soon as it hit the glass. The room seemed endless, each one reflecting the next in a distorted maze that twisted back on itself. The light, now dimming as the sun began to set outside, flickered across the mirrors, creating strange shadows where there shouldn't be any. I kept walking, determined to find the exit, but no matter how many corners I turned, there was no sign of the front door. I even tried marking one of the walls, hoping to leave a trail, but the mirrors absorbed every mark, reflecting it back in endless distortion. It was like being lost in a hall of mirrors where every direction led back to the same point. The strangest part came when I reached what I thought was the center of the house. In the middle of one room, there was a large, ornate mirror, different from the others. Its frame was old, cracked in places, but it was the reflection inside that made my skin crawl. I approached slowly, watching myself as usual. But this mirror, it was different. My reflection inside it was sharper, more defined, and there was something about the way it stared back that felt wrong. I took a cautious step toward it, and for the first time my reflection didn't move. It just stood there, frozen in the glass, watching me. I waved my hand in front of the mirror, but the reflection didn't copy me. It stayed still, eyes fixed on mine. That's when I noticed something else. It wasn't just me in the reflection. Behind my frozen doppelganger, the room looked different darker. The mirrors in that reflection weren't reflecting the same endless light as the ones around me. They were showing a space that didn't exist in my reality. It was almost as if the house in the reflection was a different version of the house I was standing in, one where the light had dimmed entirely and the air seemed thick with something more oppressive than just shadows. I stepped back from the mirror, trying to make sense of it all. As I did, my frozen reflection began to move, but not in sync with me. It turned its head slowly, scanning the room in a way that sent a ripple of unease through me. It was like watching someone else entirely, someone who just looked like me. The reflection finally locked eyes with mine again, but this time it wasn't just staring, it was smiling. A slow, deliberate grin spread across its face, a kind of knowing look that made me feel like I was missing something. I couldn't explain it, but the reflection looked like it was taunting me mocking the fact that I couldn't figure out what was really going on here. I reached up instinctively and placed my hand on the surface of the mirror. The glass was cold, unnaturally cold for a house that wasn't even refrigerated. Then it happened. The smile faded from the reflection, and for a split second, everything around me shifted. I was still in the house, but something was different. The walls no longer reflected my surroundings, they reflected a void, a deep, dark emptiness that swallowed every angle of light in the room. It was as though the house had blinked into another dimension, a darker reality. But then, just as quickly, everything snapped back to normal. 
my reflection stood still again, expressionless. The house was once more bathed in the same dull light, the mirror showing only endless versions of me. But that moment of darkness, that brief glimpse into something else, lingered. I pulled my hand back from the glass and backed away slowly. It felt like the house itself was trying to tell me something, trying to pull me into that void I'd just seen. I didn't know what to do next. Leaving seemed like the logical choice, but finding the exit was no easier now than before. The house was still a maze and the reflections were becoming more erratic, each one acting on its own, moving when I wasn't, staring when I wasn't looking. It was as if the reflections were trying to show me something, or maybe they were trying to take something from me. Either way, I didn't want to stick around to find out. I don't know how long I wandered through that house, but it felt like hours. Time seemed to stretch in there, twisted like everything else. The mirrors were no longer just reflecting. They were doing something else. It was subtle at first, like a low hum vibrating through the glass. As I walked, the hum grew louder, but it wasn't a sound you could hear with your ears. It was more like a feeling that buzzed deep in your bones, a kind of pressure that kept growing. I tried to shake it off, but that eerie sensation stuck with me, clinging to the back of my mind. No matter how many turns I took, I couldn't find the door. The reflections were playing their own game, no longer just out of sync, but mimicking other versions of me. Versions that moved differently, looked different, or even seemed to fade into the distance as I approached. Then, the voices started. At first, I thought I was just hearing the echoes of my own footsteps again, but the sound was different. It was faint, whispers almost too quiet to understand. I stopped and listened, trying to pinpoint where they were coming from. There was nothing else in the house, so they had to be coming from the mirrors. I leaned closer to one of the mirrors, focusing on the reflection. My face stared back at me, still and silent. But behind that, just barely audible, I could hear words. Whispered words, not in any language I could recognize, but the tone was unmistakable. It was as if the reflections were communicating with one another, a conversation happening on the other side of the glass. I pressed my ear closer, straining to make sense of it, but the voices seemed to blend together, overlapping in a strange chorus of sounds that sent a shiver through me. I stepped back quickly, trying to clear my head. There was no way I was hearing things from the mirrors. It didn't make sense. None of this made sense. But the whispers persisted, growing louder now, almost insistent. It was like the house was alive, like the mirrors were trying to draw me in, pull me closer to whatever was lurking just beneath the surface of the reflections. As I moved through the rooms, the whispers followed, growing louder with every step. I could hear them all around me coming from every mirrored surface. It wasn't just the sound of my voice, it was different, almost as if the reflections had their own voices, their own desires. They weren't just copying me, they were trying to communicate, trying to tell me something. I forced myself to stop. I couldn't just wander aimlessly anymore. I had to focus. There had to be a way out of here, a way to break whatever bizarre spell this house had cast over me. I looked around, trying to make sense of the space. The house was the same size on the inside as it had been from the outside. There had to be a door somewhere. I just needed to think logically, but that was becoming harder by the minute. The mirrors seemed to pulse with that strange energy, distorting the space around me. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes for a moment, trying to block out the noise. When I opened them again, the reflections had shifted. Every version of me was now standing perfectly still, staring straight ahead. No smiles, no strange movements, just silent blank expressions, as if they were waiting. I took a hesitant step forward, and none of the reflections moved. It was unnerving to say the least. I was so used to seeing them mimic my every move, even if they were delayed or distorted. But now they were just... there. Watching or maybe not watching, just being there, as if they had nothing left to show me. 
I approached one of the larger mirrors, half expecting it to do something strange, but it didn't. My reflection stood in place, calm, eyes forward. I reached out again, placing my hand against the glass. This time, the surface felt different, warmer, almost. It gave a little under the pressure, as if the mirror wasn't solid anymore, as if I could push through if I wanted to. But I didn't. Something about that idea felt wrong, like I was being invited into a place I shouldn't go. I pulled my hand back quickly, stepping away from the mirror. The whispers returned, but this time I could make out a single word. Just one. Stay. It wasn't a command. It was more like an offer, spoken in that same chorus of voices from within the mirrors. I backed up slowly, trying to distance myself from the sound, but the mirrors surrounded me. The voices grew louder, repeating that single word over and over again until it was impossible to ignore. Stay. 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 I stumbled backward into one of the other rooms, desperate to get away from the voices, but they followed, echoing off the glass. I pressed my hands over my ears, trying to block it out, but the sound wasn't just coming from the mirrors anymore. It was inside my head. The house wasn't going to let me leave. It wanted me to stay. I ran. I don't know why I hadn't tried it earlier, but panic had set in, and I bolted through the maze of mirrored rooms, searching for any sign of an exit. The reflections blurred around me as I ran past them, their voices fading into a dull roar in the background. Then, just as I was about to give up, I saw it. The front door. It stood at the end of a long hallway of mirrors, just as it had been when I first entered. I couldn't believe I hadn't seen it earlier. It was right there. But as I approached, something about it felt wrong. I slowed down, staring at the door, at my reflection standing in front of it. My reflection didn't move. It stayed perfectly still, eyes locked on mine. But this time, something was different. The reflection wasn't just showing me, it was showing something else, a shadow, just behind me. I stood there, frozen, staring at the door, my reflection staring back at me with that unsettling calmness. But it wasn't just me in the reflection anymore. There was something else. A shadow. It loomed behind me in the mirrored hallway, just out of focus, like a blur of darkness. I spun around, heart racing, but when I looked behind me, there was nothing there. The hallway was empty. I turned back to the mirror, the shadow was still there. It seemed to flicker in and out, as if it wasn't fully formed, but I could feel it, its presence lingering just at the edges of my awareness. It wasn't watching me. It wasn't following me. But it was there, inside the reflection, part of the house. The whispers had stopped. The air was still, heavy with that strange pressure I had felt earlier, as if the house was holding its breath. My reflection continued to stand perfectly still, but the shadow, it was moving now, slowly shifting behind me in the glass, almost like it was alive. I needed to leave. I knew that. But something about the door felt wrong. It was right in front of me. Yet it felt like it wasn't the real exit. Like it was part of the house's illusion. Just another trick of the mirrors. And that shadow. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was waiting for me to step closer to open the door, to do something that would let it cross over. I hesitated. Every instinct told me to run, but run where? The mirrors surrounded me, reflecting endless versions of myself, all staring back with that same blank expression. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my thoughts, and took a step forward. Nothing happened. I took another step, this time getting closer to the door. My reflection moved with me now, back in sync, but the shadow, it didn't follow. It stayed behind, hovering in the mirror, still out of focus but no longer attached to me. That made my skin prickle with unease. I was almost there, almost at the exit, but something in the back of my mind told me I was missing something important. 
the house wasn't done with me yet. I stopped just in front of the door, close enough to reach for the handle. My reflection did the same, perfectly mirroring my movements now, but the shadow lingered behind, not moving, just watching. And then I heard it. Not the whispers this time, but a soft, almost imperceptible scraping sound. It was faint, like the sound of fingernails lightly dragging against glass. It came from the walls around me, from the mirrors themselves. I glanced to my left, then my right. Everywhere I looked, my reflection stood, staring back, but I could hear something else. The sound grew louder, more insistent, as if something inside the mirrors was trying to break through, to claw its way out. My reflection remained still, expressionless, but the noise continued to build, the scraping turning into a soft, rhythmic tapping, like the ticking of a clock. That's when I noticed something strange about my reflection again. It wasn't just me anymore. In each mirror, just behind my reflection, I saw faint outlines like silhouettes. They were hard to make out, but they were there. Shadows, faint but unmistakable, standing just beyond my mirrored self. I didn't dare turn around this time. I knew whatever was in the mirrors wasn't in the real world. I took a step back, away from the door. The reflections didn't follow. They stayed still, watching me, but now I could see the silhouettes more clearly. They were growing more defined, as if the longer I stood there, the more they became real. The house wasn't just a structure made of mirrors. It was something else. The reflections weren't reflections anymore. They were something living, something aware. And the shadow in the mirror wasn't just a shadow. It was a part of the house, part of the curse, something that had been waiting for someone like me to stumble in. I tried to think rationally. The door was right there, just a few steps away. But leaving didn't feel like the solution. Whatever was in this house wanted me to leave, or at least it wanted me to try to leave. The more I thought about it, the more I realized. Leaving wasn't the answer. The house had been playing tricks on me from the start, showing me what it wanted me to see, making me believe there was a way out. But this house didn't have exits. It had traps. The only way to get out was to stop playing the house's game. I turned away from the door, away from the shadow and the endless mirrors. I walked back into the center of the room, ignoring the scraping sounds, ignoring the whispers that had started up again. I stopped in front of one of the larger mirrors, the same one I had touched earlier. My reflection stared back, blank and calm, but this time I didn't react. I didn't reach out. I didn't try to make sense of what was happening. I just stood there, and then something changed. The house grew quieter. The whispers faded, the shadows in the mirrors stopped moving, and the pressure in the air lifted just slightly. The reflection in the mirror shifted, but this time it wasn't out of sync. It moved with me perfectly in time, as if the house had decided to stop toying with me. I waited, holding my breath, but nothing happened. The house was silent, the mirrors still. It was as if, in refusing to play along, I had broken whatever spell had been cast over the place. I took one last look around at the endless reflections, at the shadows that had faded into the background. I knew then that the house didn't want me to leave, it wanted me to stay, to keep chasing the illusion of an exit. But I wasn't going to give it that satisfaction. Without looking back, I turned and walked deeper into the house, away from the door, away from the mirrors. If the house wanted to trap me, it would have to try harder than that. I walked deeper into the house, away from the door, away from the mirrors that had been playing their twisted games. The farther I went, the quieter it became. The whispers, the shadows, the strange tapping on the glass, they all faded into an eerie stillness. It was as if the house had grown tired of its tricks, like it had nothing left to throw at me. But I wasn't naive. I knew it wasn't over. The mirrors still lined the walls, reflecting endless versions of me, but they felt less threatening now. My reflection moved in sync with me, 
like it should, and the strange independent movements from earlier had stopped. But something about it all still felt wrong. There was a weight in the air, a tension that refused to lift entirely. I found myself in a new part of the house, one I hadn't seen before. The room was larger, the mirrors arranged in a perfect circle around a central space. In the middle of the room was something I hadn't expected, a single chair. It was old, wooden, and completely out of place in the otherwise sleek, mirrored environment. I approached it cautiously, unsure of what the house wanted me to see. As I stood there, looking at the chair, I realized that the mirrors weren't reflecting me anymore. They were still showing the room, but my reflection had disappeared entirely. I looked around, moving from mirror to mirror, but I was gone. It was as if I had been erased from the glass, as if the house had decided to remove me from its version of reality. The whispers returned, soft at first, then growing louder, more insistent. They weren't coming from the mirrors this time. They were coming from the chair. I stepped back, suddenly aware that I was being drawn toward it that the house wanted me to sit. Every part of me screamed not to, but the whispers. They were so familiar now. They weren't just random noises anymore. They were calling to me, urging me forward. I resisted, staying where I was, but the whispers grew louder, almost pleading. The mirrors surrounding the room began to ripple, their surfaces shimmering like water. The reflections inside them were shifting, distorting, showing fragments of something I couldn't quite make out. It was like the house was offering me a glimpse of something else, something beyond the endless maze of glass. I stepped closer to the chair, not sitting, but inspecting it. The wood was worn, scratched in places, as if countless others had sat there before me. The whispers quieted as I got nearer, almost as if they were waiting for me to make a choice. It was then that I realized what the house had been trying to do all along. The reflections, the shadows, the endless maze, it wasn't about trapping me inside. It was about drawing something out of me, something deeper. The house didn't just want me to get lost. It wanted me to surrender, to give in to the endless reflection of myself, to sit in that chair and become a part of the house. The whispers weren't just calling me. They were offering a choice, stay or leave, become one of the countless souls trapped in the glass or walk away and leave the house behind. I glanced at the mirrors one last time. They had stopped rippling, their surfaces smooth and calm once more. My reflection was still gone, but I could see something else in the glass. Faint figures, shadows of others who had come before me. They were barely visible, like echoes of people who had made the wrong choice, who had given in to the house's pull. I took a step back from the chair, refusing to sit. The whispers grew frantic for a moment, almost desperate but I didn't listen. I knew now that the house couldn't force me to stay. It could only trick me into wanting to. The door hadn't been a real exit. It had been another trap, another way for the house to lure me in deeper. But I wasn't going to play along anymore. I turned my back on the chair, walking slowly toward the far end of the room. There were no doors, no windows, no obvious way out, but I didn't care. The house had shown me its final trick, and I wasn't falling for it. As I walked, the mirrors around me seemed to shift again, their surfaces growing darker, more opaque. The figures inside faded completely, leaving only my own reflection once more. I kept walking, not sure where I was going, but certain that the house had lost its hold on me. The whispers had stopped entirely, the air was still, and the strange tension that had gripped the place was gone. I felt like I had broken through something, like I had passed whatever test the house had been setting for me, and then without warning, I found myself standing in front of the entrance again. The front door, just as I had seen it before, was right there, slightly ajar, light spilling in from the outside. I hadn't been walking in circles, hadn't been retracing my steps, yet somehow, I had ended up right where I started. The house had let me go. I stood there for a moment, hesitant, half expecting another trick, another illusion. But nothing happened. The door was real, the light was real, and outside I could hear the distant rustle of the wind in the trees. 
I walked toward the door, pushing it open slowly. The cool air from outside hit my face and I stepped through. As soon as I was outside, the door swung shut behind me with a soft click. I turned around, expecting to see the same quaint little cottage I had entered hours ago, but what I saw was different. The house was no longer covered in mirrors. It looked like an old, abandoned building, its windows cracked, its roof sagging. There were no reflections, no strange shadows, nothing. Just a broken down structure in the middle of the woods forgotten by time. I stood there for a long moment, trying to make sense of everything. Had it all been a trick? Had the house really been what it seemed? Or had it just been some elaborate illusion? I didn't know and honestly I didn't care. All I knew was that I had escaped. I didn't look back as I walked away from the house, leaving the strange mirrored nightmare behind. Whatever it had wanted from me, it hadn't gotten it, and that was enough. And 